Hey, Steve. Welcome to American Paleo. This is our prep lab in northern Kentucky. Let's go on in. We'll take a look at the shop. My name's Dan Cooper. I'm a fossil enthusiast. Been collecting fossils for 50 years, I guess. And today we're going to take a quick look at our prep lab. And you know, I was sitting around a lot of a lot of stuff. If we get prepped here, this is a a big fish we just finished up. We we had some of this stuff posted on Facebook uh, last month, and the storage shelves literally have tons of unprepared fossils. This is all of our customers based stuff. You'll see the different labels and stuff on it. We got a couple main clients that does probably 50% of our our business. Pick it in the field, and it may work out, and it may not. In the field, it's kind of hard to see is it going to be good or not. So what we do is we go through it real quick. We kind of high grade some of the best stuff. Hey, make sure you work on that isotelus from Maysville or whatever. So we'll work on that first. So this is where we store everything. And with the prep lab, we use a lot of pneumatic tools and air braces. So we have to have a utility room with a, a high quality supplies of tools. So you'll see in here. We've got a, a Quincy Industrial Air Compressor, pretty expensive tool. Our pneumatic tools don't like moisture, so we have a dryer. This is a refrigerated dryer, which takes all moisture out of the system. Then we have two industrial dust collectors, which cycle through the dust as we work in the air braces and the chisels and stuff like that. And then you go over to the area where this is where we do our 99% of our work is our our prep stations. We use uh, air braces to clean stuff, and we really use everything we have as SS white. We fit, we've uh, standardized on one type of unit because the parts are similar, and we know how to repair them. There's a bunch of different air braces out there that you can use for things. Now, what this does, it takes a very fine powder, almost like talcum powder, and it goes through an air system, and we have a vibrator which actually shakes it through baffles and brings the powder into the prep area. This is a, a, a typical prep station. And uh, you'll see the, the dust collecting systems here. We'll try to maintain the dust, and it's a central system that all goes back, all goes back to the, the uh, dust collectors in the utility room. But we have two stations at each work area. We have a, we call a shooting station. This is where we use our air abrasives. And we use a very small tip unit with about 90 PSI. And this is where we clean the fossils. And we try to keep much, as much of the dust out of the shop as we can. So we have an area in here. You see we have I've made baffles, 3D printed some uh, some flexible plastic to keep, keep it surrounded around your hands. So we shoot everything in here. And we do everything under a microscope in the air abrasive area. And with the chiseling, it's the same way. We try to use a microscope. There's a number of different chisel types. This is a heavy duty unit. This is for, for roughing basically. And this is about $1,500. These, these, these chisels are pretty expensive. And then we have a, a variety of different types of chisels. Each one does a different thing. This is Chicago pneumatic. This is more like pounding, whereas the, the scribes are more like fine chisels. So this takes out matrix a little bit quicker. Not as, not as quick as that, but it takes out a little bit quicker. And then as you get closer down to the fossils, you go to finer and finer tools. You can see the real fine tip on them. Because there's not on. And then another different style chisel he uses. All different types of tools. And some of the chisels are pointed chisels. Some of them are flat. They do different things. The flats are good for sculpturing surfaces, make them look, look nice and smooth. And then each station we have, uh, you know, like a tray which holds the different types of glues. We use exclusively star bond epoxies. Um, we do have D5, D72, which is a, uh, a acetone based plastic, which a lot of the museums like to use because of the longer life and the, and the more stability. But the super glue works best for us and it, and it's easy to use. So we've got some of our master guys. This is, this is Patrick over here working. Uh, Patrick has a degree in art. We found out through through trial and error that the best preppers are artists. We tried geologists, we tried guys off the street and that type of stuff. Good mechanics, and I guess. But the best guys have been the artists because of their mentality, the way they look at things, 
the way their their psyche is that they can sit for eight hours in a row and find a, a microscope and not go crazy. Patrick's got a degree in art. Ken is her other prepper. Ken has a degree in art. Ben has, has some art background. He's taken some colleges at, at the University of Cincinnati. And then uh, this is my grandson's face from here where he works. And you can see that's kind of what it is. And you, you can see Ken in here. You can get through the glass. He's aerobrating a specimen right now. He's kind of blowing off, see what he's got. Got. And that's to get out of the, the uh, SS White units. And his set of tools. And you can see, you know, each one of these microscopes, probably $500. So one, two, three, four, five, he's probably got $3,000 of microscopes in here. And all these pneumatic chisels are the same way. They're pretty expensive to buy them new. Lighting's important. Whenever we abrade, we use different styles of light. We have uh, LEDs. We have uh, halogens to give you a more complete spectrum of the lighting. If you use just one type of light, it doesn't give you a, a true look when you go out and look in the sunlight. Just a sample of some of the stuff that you work on, you know, the the trilobites. These are some trilobites that have gone through, been air braided. And you can see what they look like. Uh, it looks like this before you air braid it, kind of dusty and nondiscreet. And then when you air braid it, that all come, pops out for you. When you finish it up, there's repair and, and blending and stuff like that. This is what we call our clean room. So we have it separated intentionally. It's got its own separating dust collecting system. And here's where we do the touch up with the paint and the coloring and the repairs and, and, and all that type of stuff. But it's designed to do that because it's a finished room. And you can see this is some stuff that's being finished up. This is the plate that Ben's working on. The Richter is a pretty famous fossil. Just about every fossil collector knows what a Richter it is. So we do a lot of the touch up. It costs money to prepare a fossil. So, you know, average cost is probably 100 to $200 to prep a fossil. And if it's a brachiopod or a crinoid stem, you don't want to put that kind of money in. So it's got to be a, a worthwhile specimen to do it. And, you know, typically a fossil, when it's found until it's pre prepared, it's not very valuable. It has to be cleaned up. And question is, do you put $500 into a nice trilobite piece for your collection? Uh, most people don't do that. A lot of the stuff we do here is commercial collectors because they're going to resell it. So they can say, yeah, I'll put five hours prep into it. I'll sell it for $2,000. We do. We turn, we make a fossil that's really unprepared. Don't know what you got. You know, maybe it's a hundred worth a hundred dollars. We'll, we'll put time on it and maybe make it a thousand dollars. best. We do a lot, a lot of stuff like that. And that's so Dan, how long have you been doing this? Uh, that's a good question. I, uh, I know I started in the mid seventies, whatever, 70, 73. So what's that? Almost 50 years. I don't like everybody else. I started as a hobby. I, I was an aerospace engineer and it was something to, uh, take the stress off. It was something to really weekend. I just love like everybody else going on a site. You know, I had a couple sites that I picked out. I spent hundreds, thousands of hours on there. And I, I just, unlike the, Starting out collector, I just sit on my butt and I just go through the layer systematically and pick out all the fossils. And what you do when you do a site like that, you learn what's in certain horizons you concentrate on. You get your eye trained. For example, Dews Road, there was a, a zone where we had real small flexicalamy, kind of like a famous spot up in Caesars Creek. And nobody had ever found anything like that later. But I spent so much time there, I, I knew where to look. And I, I found, I don't know, probably 50 or 60 over the years. And I got some some of the rare fossils, some some sororis, gidiums, hypostones. There was one layer that was just full of sororis, hypostones. And unless you know the layers and spend a lot of time going over the layers, you would never see it. You walk right over it. But I spent on my hands and knees up close. The younger one, my eyes are really good. And I got some, some beautiful crinoids, some other rare trilobites. I found like six different species of Cincinnati trilobites at that site. Not necessarily all whole, but uh, Ocatella was a really neat trilobite, big high eyes on a faceted eye. So I found a bunch of Ocatella heads. Potentially, if I had known what I'd known today and I could have worked in some of the shale beds, I might have got some complete specimens. You know, the problem with surface collecting is once you walk over a site in four hours, it's done until it rains and six months later. And I was much more impatient on that. And I thought, boy, if I could dig this later, I could, I could come out every day and collect and find stuff. Right. So I worked a deal out with the guy. I said, hey, Bill, 
I want to do, take some trial wipes in there. Do you have a problem with that? And this was, again, 50 years ago when the legal system wasn't so overbearing on us fossil collectors. And it was a lot different back then. I was a dozer and I took off to about a foot of layer and I dug it. And we dug, I don't know, probably 1,000, 2,000 flexies out of the quarry bill there. Great spot. And that got me started realizing is there's more to fossil collecting if you really want to dig into it than just surface collecting. Surface collecting, great. I, I love surface collecting. And then probably 90% of the people, that's the way they like to go. I had to collect. Now, when I went out to collect for a weekend, I wanted to make sure that when I collected eight hours, I found something. So you can go to the site and walk it over and not find much. Right. So by putting some money into it, some time and effort, uh, you could mine a site and then be guaranteed every day that you're going to get spectacular stuff. And I had the opportunity to buy Mount Orb, which you've been, you guys have been you collected Mount Orb. You yes. see what it is. That was amazing. Yep. Here. So I bought the property, I think 82. Had a, a, a dozer in there first off and opened a big hole up. And a learning curve. I was down too low, so the layer was leached and the trolobites weren't very good. And that dig, we probably got maybe 50 trolobites in a hole that was 40 by 60. You know, Mount Orange has been incredible. There's probably average of a trolobite to a trolobite and half every square feet. So when you open up a 40 by 50, 50 area to dig, you're going to find 2,000 trolobites. In there. Now, also, also there's isotheles in there, normally about 10 to 1. So every every 10 flex, we find one isotheles. So we find 200, 300 isotheles. And back then, the zone where we were collecting, there was a lot of large isotheles, large being 8 inches. With that, I've got property that I've dug all over. I leased a Sylvania quarry up in Sylvania, Ohio, famous quarry. Uh, leased Waldron quarry. Um, my partner and I have bought property in, at uh, Crawfordsville, New York, o Oklahoma. We've had leases. Got a, a Shark's Tooth Hill in California, Bakersfield, California. We've got a lease out there. Um, so a lot of different properties. And again, I do it all the way I do it is I dig it. That's amazing. And uh, actually, a lot of your fossils have ended up in museums, right? Sure, sure, yeah. I, there's a there's a issue typically with some of the I'll call them professionals, the academics and the amateur collectors that they think that we shouldn't collect fossils. Not all of them are like that. Some of them are great, but there's a lot of them. And they're the squeaky Wilson, and they're the ones that get all the attention that say, you know, the amateur collectors shouldn't be collecting fossils, specifically dinosaurs. They're really that bad about dinosaurs. But I basically collect stuff, and, and I spend a lot of money. I spend my American Express bill probably is $40,000 a year, $50,000 a year. And I'm a retired aerospace engineer, I've got money, but I can't kind of afford to justify that kind of money. So I sell the stuff. I sell the second rate stuff, the stuff that's not scientifically valuable. It, but the answer to your question is if it's something unusual, maybe a, a very rare specimen like a carpoid. I found two carpoids in my career, both of them are at the Cincinnati Museum Center. Found a big crinoid plate uh, uh, that's at Cincinnati Museum Center. So something that's scientifically valuable, I definitely uh, work with the museums and donate. I've got stuff and several Chicago Field Museum, Royal Ontario Museum, the British Museum of Natural History, Houston Museum, which is a great museum. Houston is one of the best open display museums that I know of as far as fossils go. It's a great, and Sam Stubbs done a great job of making that what it is. And then I'll, I'll, if they have a research, for example, I got a call from Brenda Hunda a couple of years ago that she wanted 50 perfect rolled up flecticalamine to measure and do scientific study on. And so I Pulled out of my collection and gave her 50 perfect flexies. So stuff like that. And I do a lot of teaching. You know, we got to work for the young kids in this hobby. Keep them interested in it. So I, I try to work with the young kids. I donate a lot of stuff at shows and a box the kids can go in. And stuff, so. well, you're doing a lot. And you're making these fossils available to us, you know, amateur collectors like me yep. and Laura here. And uh, we're, of course, passing that on to our kids. You've seen our kids. Oh, well, yeah. They're, they're all about stuff. it. Yep, yep. And uh, uh, it's it's absolutely fantastic. Well, the problem is, if you don't keep the general public interested in it, uh, eventually the academics are going to go away. There's not going to be support for that. And they don't realize that is, If you don't have people that, that go to the university and say it's important that you have dinosaurs to work on, eventually your university is going to say we don't, we're not interested in that. For example, the big problem right now we have especially in invertebrate stuff, and, and major historically famous paleos uh, institutes, for example, Cincinnati Museum, Miami University, their paleo departments are basically dissolving. Miami's de departments all but gone. 
you see is nothing what it used to be. And the biggest biggest part of that is there's in, not that much interest from the public nowadays. Part of it's the, the uh, electronic technology, the phones and the games and all that kind of stuff that people do. But a lot of it's the attitude that comes out of the professionals that, you know, it's it's criminal to collect fossils on, on federal lands, or it's criminal to collect fossils on, on state land. And, and people take that to heart, and so you lose interest in it. And they're, in my mind, they're cutting their own throat on that kind of stuff. You need to work with people. And, you know, for example, if, if you're worried about the scientific part of it, then work more to educating the amateur collectors so that they collect them that's responsibility or responsible enough that the the academic can say, yeah, we can use that data because you, you've collected this and this and this. You right. done this away, but, but there's none of that. There's, it's the opposite way around. That especially the, the vertebrate people, they, they go out of their way not to let amateurs collect stuff. It's really, really detrimental to the to the science and the education to it. In my mind, it, it's really, I can see it in 50 years I've been collecting fossils, I can see a big change in the interest to them and in the interest to the public. There's just much, much less people in there. There's still a lot of people interested in fossils, but not nearly like they used to be. And the attitude, too. Well, I say it all the time, not just with fossils, with uh, animals, and because you know we do a lot with reptiles and yeah. such. If people aren't uh, getting experience with this, if they're not introduced to it, if they don't get to interact, they're not going to care. And you know, like to your point, in the future, that's really going to hurt hurt the fields more than anything. If if we're not able to, at some extent, you know, you get involved with this, and so I think what you're doing is great. And uh, when when you invited us to come up to Mount Oregon, we had the absolute best time, and we couldn't wait to get home and show off the fossils that we found there. Uh, we've probably shown the fossils off to several hundred people, and uh, you know, and that's just it, it was awesome. Share, and, uh, share the share the fun, yeah. Quite honestly, when I when I collect Mount Oregon, now I've collected probably 20, 25,000 trilobites of Mount Oregon. And after you've collected that many, you don't get real excited. I still, I still enjoy finding a nice trial but it's, it's not like it was when you collected your first one, the first person come in. So I, I really enjoy people like yourself coming out and collecting and sharing them. I have, I definitely have more time, better time, uh, bringing people out and having them find a trial bike and find it myself. Well, we were super grateful. <laughs> and you were, you were super nice. And, and you know, it, it's, a, it's stuff like yourself I mean typically most of the fossil collectors I know have other things they love to do they love to collect arrowheads they love fish they love to collect mushrooms they're collectors they love right. to metal detect it's it's interesting it's 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 something that's in your genes that once you like to do it you know I, I, I metal detect I like to collect many artifacts I like to do a lot of different stuff like that but mushrooms I love collecting mushrooms I love like them greens, wild greens, the good greens. So it's it's something that you, you do in almost everybody to a T. They're not just fossil collectors. They do other stuff. It's just something that you love to do. So yeah, I, I can see see that. Yeah, so what? Ken's Ken's doing some final touch ups on stuff. And again, what he's doing is he's highlighting when you clean fossil with the air abrasive, if you have a tendency to sandblasting and you lose a lot of color. <clears throat> so what we do is we'll put a protective coat on it, kind of like a clear coat, and it actually extenuates the fossils. Brings them back, you can see that's what it's going to be sure without, without doing that, it would be, it would be pretty dull. And when you, when, you, when you prep a specimen, it's important to make the specimen the center of attraction on a piece. So you try to neutralize the matrix, and you'll see all the matrix on here, there's no scratch marks or anything from the prep. <clears throat> we try to make the matrix look as natural as possible, and it's important when you look at a piece, the first thing your eye catches is the specimen you want to see. The best situation for the fossils and what's going to preserve them and, and uh, to get them out of the ground and make them right. But, uh, this attitude of not letting anybody collect anything anywhere is, is not helping anybody. By the same token as you don't want a, a free-for-all. You don't want every, every Tom, Dick, and Harry going out and, and collecting a dinosaur and being on land because they, they will destroy it. But in my mind, the, the best way is the synergy of the amateurs and the commercials is you if you if you want to collect fossils on federal lands you have to have a permit just like you do to, to fish right uh -huh. sure. and that money would go into a kitty where it would support the the professionals and what you do is before you get that permit you got to go through the training like like a hunter 
guns and stuff like that. So you would give them the, the training of how to collect a fossil so that somebody doesn't go out to pull a fossil up and, and bring it back and set it on the porch and all the scientific data is gone, you train them. And to do that, you have to have the permits. And with that same line is you can't go out and collect a, a T-Rex and take it home and keep it. You know, if that's, if that's something scientifically valuable, it should go back to the institutes. And there's, you know, Germany's a good country that does that. As an amateur, you can find stuff. And, and the government can take it from you, but they have to give you some monetary value. Maybe not millions of dollars, but at least pay for your expenses and stuff like that. And that's, that's the kind of, that's the way I would see it would be the best for the fossils. Dan, thank you so much for showing us around. We really appreciate it. You're doing some amazing things here, and uh, I hope you do really good at the Tucson show. And we'll keep in touch, and we'll probably uh, hound you again until we can get out fossil collectors. Always, again. it's always a good time. Sure. Share our knowledge of the hobby and make it interesting to everybody. Kids, the amateurs, the academics, make it make it enjoyable to everybody. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for coming.